नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणी निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशकारिणी कृपा सिंधु पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवाशादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे so we were speaking about lord nityananda lord nityananda is not not different from lord chaitanya just as krishna and balaram are the same supreme lord they are not different from each other एक ही स्वरूप है भिन्न होकर सेम स्वरूप डिफरेंस इज एर का फॉर्म स्पेसिफिकली देर बॉडीली कलर इज डिफरेंट So why do they take up these two forms or different forms? Krishna Lila is Sah, so that there is more uh, interactions in Krishna Lila. Bhinna uh, Matraka. So that was more. so lord krishna and lord balaram are the same supreme personality of god similarly lord chaitanya and lord nityananda are the same supreme personality of god what does that mean it means that we should not make any distinction between the two at the same time whenever we are hearing about the past times of the lord or whenever we are very much engrossed in the past times of lord chaitanya and lord nityananda we should understand the distinction does that make sense does that happen in regular life also is it relatable any examples let me give you an example maybe you have experienced with maybe i'll give you a couple of examples <coughs> i was inspired especially here in this concert upon valley when i see the green house in every house <laughs> so to lassi we worship her and one very important relationship that we have with her is that we take the tulasi leaves 
and put it in the Bhoga output. Is that correct? True or not true? Sometimes we may, depending upon, you know, maybe there is some time crunch or whatever, we may actually collect a few leaves and keep it stored. Is that true? Yes. You've done that? Yes. Okay. You're about to make an offer. So open your, you open your box of Tulsi leaves. And suddenly you're inspired like, all right, let me go and pluck some fresh leaves. Has that happened? Now, the fresh leaves and the leaves that are there in that box, plucked previously, are they the same or different? Is there any difference in the potency? Tulasi, you offer it in the bhoga, Lord Krishna accepts. You offer her in the bhoga, offerings, Lord Krishna accepts, correct? But still, sometimes you feel fresh to this. So now we are making distinction. You understand the point? So when we are understanding the um, pastimes of the Lord and we are getting engrossed in it, that is when we notice the distinction or we understand the distinction. Otherwise, we have the same personality of God. <clears throat> Okay. So Lord Chaitanya had instructed Nityananda Prabhu to come to Bengal and spread the awareness of the glories of the chanting of the Holy Names. So he was doing that. Some miscreants they felt that they should, they had an opportunity to steal from Sri Nityananda Prabhu. And we have been trying to discuss that since the past two sessions. So if you have not attended those sessions, it doesn't really matter. Because every session has its own uh, unique and this is the nature of the Lord and the Lord's activities. It is transcendental. What it means is that it is not bound by time space. It is not constrained by time and space. So even if you do not complete an entire pastime, whatever you have finished reading or understanding, how, no, after spending some time, let's say you spend a couple of hours and the pastime is not completed as given to us by Vyasadeva, as given to us by Srila Prabhupada, the authors. Whatever you have understood and whatever you have read is it complete in itself. Sometimes we feel that as a um, a regulation, we should try and complete the whole thing as a regulation. So that's all. However, if it is not your regulation and you're not able to complete the entire chapter, the pastime that is there, it is still complete and one should not feel any lacking. Still complete. Like, let's say we've Heard that in Dwarka, Mother Rohini is describing the pastimes of Krishna. That there is one description like that. So the queens of Dwarka, they are sitting around her and listening to Krishna's pastimes, childhood pastimes. Krishna and Balaram, they feel they kind of understand that this is happening within our palace. 
So they come, they want to come and also participate in it. So when they come there, do you think they said, please can you start from again before? So I think I've made my point. Yeah, it's complete. However, if it is your regulation, then you should follow your regulation. If it is a regulation that you need to complete the entire chapter, however long or short it is, please follow the regulation because that is a commitment that you've taken unto yourself. So two attempts have been made to steal from Nityananda Prabhu. Two consecutive evenings, two consecutive nights. And these are of the thieves that were there, they were actually dacoits. So the dacoits, the dacoit leader and his gang of dacoits, they are, uh, they have lived a full life in the material world. I mean, they are well experienced people. So it's not easy to surprise someone who has lived a long life or who has had a lot of experiences in life. Is it? Some of you, if you have elders in your family and you're trying to explain to them how important Krishna consciousness is, you face those roadblocks. Like they are always nodding, this is good, this is good, but what about the next step? Yeah. So it's not easy to surprise people who have lived a full life, who have lived through a lot of experiences in life because they've seen a lot. They've, and, and they are intelligent people. They've understood so many uh, ways. They have understood so many perspectives. So the Steves were not like, they're not, they were not beginners. They are well established as a Dakoid gang. Like they had a lot of fan following. <laughs> they were like celebrities. I'm not, I mean, I'm trying to explain it in today's context, but actually they were well known. They were very ferocious. <coughs> yeah. However, those, uh, the events of those two nights completely flustered them. They did not know how they should try and relate to it. For the first time in their lives and in their profession, they were really confused. They were having self-doubts. For the first time in their profession, they were actually not able to trust each other. Because everyone's understanding and opinion was a little different. Does it happen in the material world? It happens, right? What is it? Blood brothers through life and death, blood sisters or something like that. And suddenly they are in a situation where each one acts according to how they understand it. And you're like, you did not care for me. You did not care for me. And you know, I trusted you so much. I trusted you so much. Finished. They immediately go to the separation proceedings. I'm not just speaking about the family structure. I'm speaking about any, any unit friends or uh, professionals, people who have been in partnership, you know, in business, business uh, partnerships for so many decades and suddenly they come up they, and they've been good at it. And when a particular business deal is so uh, confusing, very confusing, like all of the experiences experience that, uh, that they've had fails 
in helping fails to help them understand how did this happen? Why is it so confusing? Then they have clashes. So the leader could see that they were having clashes. Very smart leader. Taking or under the pretext of, you know, that previous night, they had the experience of this very well-built guards protecting the perimeter of Lord Nitananda's house. So he's like, I think these, these guards are going to stay for some time. Let us take a break of 10 days. Vacation time. Just go to some you know, sauna place. Relax. Go to the beach. Play pool. Whatever. Take a break. Don't think about this. When we come back after 10 days, I'll, I'll have a plan. All right? So they took a break and therefore in Chaitanya Bhagavat, those 10 days are not described. Basically, we have to understand that the author felt that the break is not worth describing. The author just says that Nityanand Prabhu happily spent his time there with Hiranyapandit. That is it. So what is the happy time that they spent together? Hiranyapandit is renounced. Practically does not have any grains in his house. Fun time. One is an Abdhut, the other is a renunciate. So what is the fun they have? Chant Hare Krishna. And whenever they are a little hungry, they go out begging a little. Or people who already know Hiranya Pandit village life, when you know that someone is very saintly and renounced, then they want to come and share. Somebody would drop by some food for them. Some pressure. Nice life. At least on paper, isn't it? Whenever we hear descriptions of a lifestyle that is very simple, it seems attractive, very difficult to practice. So that is how they spend their time, 10 days. After 10 days, the gang comes together. Yesterday, we ended with this wonderful verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Kathanchan smrite yasmin dushkaram sukaram ved vismrite viparitam sya shri chaitanya namamitam. The essence of this verse is that simply by the remembrance of the Lord, Life becomes easy. And the most difficult of challenges also seemingly just pan out. Forgetfulness of the Lord makes it difficult even to tackle simple uh, activities of life. Yeah. Let's say, uh, again, we'll come back to. An example from everyday life. Tulasi leaves, offerings to the Lord. It's, it's very routine. Everyone has experienced it. Routine work. Is it routine work? Routine work. Let's suppose one day you're making an offering to the Lord. You have prepared the plate and you opened the box of Tulasi leaves and you've forgotten the Lord. Your mind is on your coding because that is what you are doing. You took a break, you had to do the offering. Somebody told you, you know, that voice from the sky that comes from the other room, please do the offering. That voice, the Akashwani. So you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, lunch break or whatever, you go, the plate is ready. Okay, you have to open the box, to the silly, you've forgotten the Lord. Has it happened that sometimes you remember that the tulsi leaf is not put in the plate after you've put it on the altar? You're doing your offering prayers, you know, whatever offering prayers you remember, like uh, A, Z, B, D, F, G, H. You're doing those prayers and halfway through the prayers, oh, tulsi! 
Where is she? Is there anyone who's never been through that experience? So you see, the simplest of acts has become difficult. You're like, oh, wait, cannot offer. I have to run back. Go to the kitchen, get the box immediately. Oh, is it washed? Not washed. Ashman, not Ashman. Practically, your heart rate has increased now. Simplest of tasks becomes. So the verse is actually true. Isn't it? Very true. Similarly, here, if Davandas Thakur says that great personalities like Lord Ganesh who removes or who benedicts people by removing their obstacles, they are constantly remembering the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda. Constantly remembering them. Yes. Oh, he had a lot of jewelry on him. Silk. A lot of silk. Turbans of various different uh, cloths of silk. Gold. <coughs> now, maybe after the class, we can have a chat again when I describe how he got all of that. Because I said he's an Abhadhuk, so he did not really have any uh, inheritance. And he never earned, he did not have a salary ever, so, and he never stole, doesn't steal, but he still had all of that. Anyway, so that is what they were trying to do. Oh, so Lord Nityananda, by the mercy of Lord Nityananda, Life becomes simple. All fear, any kinds of fear that we have, would be, would be dispelled if we understand how merciful Lord Nityananda is. This Lord Nityananda for these 10 days. He was walking the streets of Navadri. He was dancing, he was chanting, doing kirtan. He would stay in the house of Hirane Pandit. His body is still decorated with all of those precious gems and jewels. He would be always smiling. His eyes would always be rolling because he was completely intoxicated in love of Krishna. And his devotees would be so happy spending time with him. However, every evening, he would go back to take rest at Hiranyapalit's house, and it was just him and her. Can you imagine the extent the Lord goes to to try and save one soul? I mean, he's the Lord of the universe. <laughs> or maybe he has, he's very possessive. This possessiveness of Lord Nityananda is very much acceptable. Isn't it? So that night, when the Dakots come together, the court king says that we have worshipped Chandi nicely, we have taken good rest, the minds are completely uncluttered and focused on the job. That's good. The entire gang, they dress up, they have, they have a special dress made for this occasion, dark blue that would merge. Like the army has army fatigues, the courts have court fatigues. Yeah. Dark blue things. The night was ripe for their pluckings because it was an overcast night. 
no luminaries. See, they were feeling that Chandi is pleased. God is Chandi is assisting us. What was happening was, which they couldn't realize immediately, but in down dust hypothesis is that the sky became overcast with black, glowing, thunderous clouds, dark and ominous. And the entire sky, the informament, earth, everything was plunged into darkness. It was as if the Lord was manifesting his impersonal form. Everything seemed one. So the dacoit fatigues and they had their dacoit night vision goggles. Trained people, right? I told you. They had left a full night. Sometimes you think dacoits of those days did not have good technology. Whatever they knew, they used it to the best. They knew how to trace out people in the dark. They knew where exactly they have to look in your house or in the bank for the wealth that would give them the maximum returns. They had, otherwise, why would they be dacoits? They were good at that job, right? So the sky was overcast. It was as if they were bad omens. However, they thought that this is helpful. And for, uh, up till now, it seemed that it was helpful on both sides. <laughs> we know that it, is, it could be helpful because it is thunderous clouds. The streets were deserted. The decoits held their weapons close to themselves. However, they had a shiver go up their spines because they were they had never experienced a night like this ever. Sometimes we are in your what holy places have you been to? Vrindavan, how many people have been to Vrindavan? So oh, practically almost everyone. You have not been to Vrindavan? Any, any place, holy place you've been to? No? The temple here? Okay. How many of you have tried this out? Like, let us you know, feel the mood of Vrindavan in the darkness. Not in the darkness, but in the night, in the night light. Have you tried to do that? Sometimes. In the darkness, early morning parikrama. It's not as yet light. Have you experienced that? Yeah. Have you experienced that uh, in your hometown growing up? Dark night. Electricity goes away. No electricity. You're not even sure if there are people around you like, is there someone? Koye, Koye, where are you? you? Call out for your friends, that kind of experience. Have you ever had a shiver go up your spine? Why? Because it is a different kind of night. There are no lights. So they were feeling a little uncomfortable. And because of because there was discomfort, they were feeling a little gloomy. As they came closer to the house, every single one of them was struck by blindness. Vision gone. Their goggles were useless because their eyes were useless now. And they have no idea how that happened. Has it ever happened to you? Ever? Especially after Nirjal Ekadeshi, towards the end, <laughs> when you're practically falling unconscious. If you haven't, try out Nirjal Ekadeshi. <laughs> because this comes 
practically on the most the hottest day of the year in the northern hemisphere it's coming up and if you want to make it a very very relishable experience come to vrindavan for nirgala ekadashi hot dry the throat practically is parched your body is on fire provided you are in vrindavan and not in your ac room leave it there it practically you know it's it, you sit down for chanting and when you stand up it's dark all around the bp just shoots down and your eyes constrict what happened give me a moment <laughs> then you you want the blood circulation to come back so the bp immediately shoots up blood flows when you start seeing again so at that moment you feel very very uncomfortable because all that you know all that you understand your existence itself it seems it's all lost remember that moments that momentary experience when there is darkness you feel cold you feel the heart has stopped it's a reaction the body's reaction the nervous system is making that happen the body is going into the stealth mode it's trying to protect itself so shut down all over except the most important organs what a wonderful creation the god's creation the human body and its responses so that is what happened to them blindness and when that happens and you are out in the open most commonly you get separated from the others because you realize you are on your own and when people are on their on their own when they realize they are on their own in unknown territory they panic so panic set in they stumble forward trying to grope in the darkness adults with weapons decoits trained professionals as soon as they are struck with blindness they tried to hold their weapons with its straps against the body and they went on all fours groping because in the wild the closest thing that can give you any indication of what is where is the earth isn't it true that is what you do you immediately sit down feel this is safe can i go ahead or not and after that when you are little confident then you stand up and use your feet now to do the same thing the first instinct is down so they they were doing that they were almost on their fours and this is in the wild this is in the you know outside the undergrowth they were being struck by twigs they were hitting rocks they were struck with fear because all of a sudden they are blind their intellect was paralyzed they were practically unable to function and suddenly they realize in the panic mode they have to take care of themselves so some of them they ran and because they did not know which direction they were running in they landed into a moat you know what is a moat many times typically in the villages there is a little moat around the house sometimes it is called as a nala it takes away the waste water sometimes it is only on one side of the house sometimes it is all around the house this is also uh, created by the dripping other uh, uh, drops dropping from the roof during rains and to protect yourself from creepy crawlies also you sometimes people create a deeper moat a deeper nala because the creepy crawlies go in and then they don't want to climb out so they stay there and they may even fill it with water so that they do not go across 
protection. They could protect themselves like that. Generally, forts have them. Forts. But houses also can. So, the, some of them, they fell into that moat. But typically, wherever there is this Nala-like thing, Nali, Nala, there's a collection of mulch at the bottom. And wherever there's mulch, what do you have? Not as yet. Snakes don't like mulch so much. Insects. Lots of insects. Leeches. Mosquitoes. Everything that can make your life miserable. <laughs> so they fall into that. They are blind. They have no idea what they have fallen into. They try to grope around. They are not able to climb out. They simply accept their misery being beaten, uh, being bitten by leeches, mosquitoes, dark ants, other crawlies that are not happy that they've been woken up in the night. Miserable. They have all these boils from the bites. There's nothing else they can do. They cannot run off. They are blind. A few of the decoits, they lose their way and they fall into the open dirt pile, the garbage pile. Villages? Do you know where the trash is? Somewhere in one corner outside the house. And now in that trash, what is there? Snakes, scorpions. Because it's damp. Anything, you know, all the creepy crawlies that like damp space. So insects, scorpions, some snakes, they started stinging them. And it was very vicious, the sting. Because they've fallen into it, they couldn't come out of it. Have you been blindfolded and pushed into a ditch ever? Have you been blindfolded and pushed into a clump of blankets? No. You never had fun as going there. <laughs> what did you have? <laughs> Friends on the laptop or what? <laughs> the iPad. We had friends, you know, uh, we, we would play in India, play cricket. So cricket was basically road cricket. It wasn't a road, it was basically an alley. Our times, we would have hedges on both sides of that road that led to the house. You know, hedges, garden hedges. So all of a sudden, four or five of us would gang up on someone or they, four or five of them would gang up on me and boom into the hedge. You've never had that kind of fun. So when you fall into a hedge like that and you want to climb out, it's where would you get traction? So the more you try to get out, the more you fall into the hedge. Right? And because these are hedges that have been made, even there, if they are not maintained, the leaves, the twigs, they all scratch you. But it's fun. The point that, uh, that we are making is when you fall into garbage pile, the more you try to get out, the more you go into it. And the more you go into it, those who are the residents, they don't like immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like the fact that you are you have a non-immigrant visa. <laughs> And you're trying to get more into that territory. So they really sting you. Yeah. A few others, they walked straight into a bush of thorns. Have you been trekking ever? Have you gone trekking here? Have you tried out trails that are not well marked? Don't try it. But it's fun. <laughs> It's fun. You can mark your trail for a certain distance and if you feel that, hey, it's leading nowhere, come back because you've just marked it. If you're going on unmarked trails, please mark, 
go for a short distance, see if you're comfortable. If you're not, trace your steps back. But if some of you are courageous enough, I have one point of time with just two other people. We, we trekked in the Himalayas from Badrinath to Kedarnath, Kedarnath to Yamunotri. It was fun. Sometimes you just had uh, one million kinds of trees and shrubs around you and nothing else. You're never alone. Yeah, it's fun. What is very interesting is that when you go into, uh, you know, where human civilization has not taken up the maintenance plan, untouched by human civilization, the wild, then a lot of prickly thorn bushes grow, a lot of them, because they are like, you know, they are like those really determined immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> They find ways not just to stay but also proliferate. These thorny bushes. So they walked right into a thorny bush, and it was as if they were having very intense surgery with sharp knives. Intense, but not very deep surgery. It was like they were being pricked by some needles and it would come out, pricked by some other. They would try to move their hand from that which was pricking them here. It would be the back of their hand would be now pricked. Some, some needly like thing would just puncture their skin. It was miserable for them. They were bruised all over. They were suffering from so much pain. And the more they tried to avoid being punctured, the more they got punctured. Because the more they wanted to keep themselves safe, they would move. And as soon as they would move, there would be other thorns like Aja Pyare, Pas Hamare, Kahe Ghabarai. You heard that song? So the thorns are like that. Come, come, come. We haven't punctured anyone since a long time. We are really having doubts about our existence, yeah. existential questions. Yeah. Here, Krishna supports everyone, including the thorns. They're getting punctured, the skin. Others, somehow, they just turn in, in a particular direction and they went on a tangent. It's like they, where are we? We've, we've been walking for ages now and we haven't hit anything. They went away far away from the house. And in the darkness, they landed up falling into a canal that was on the outskirts of the village. A deep canal with flowing water. So they became wet, they hit their heads against the bank of the canal, the walls of the canal. You're moaning and groaning in pain with fractured legs and fractured hands. Very gruesome the description. Sorry. You're getting all of this for free. Otherwise, you have to take subscription of Netflix. <laughs> this is for free. Many decoids suddenly felt feverish. They were hit by this very high fever. And they were shivering with fever, sweating. They were being, they were in great agony, being tortured. They were like, what? Why? Why us? At that moment, from the friendly neighborhood, Somebody offered help, or maybe he did not offer help, but offered something. Who was that? Lord Indra. He said, this is, you went up to Nityananda Prabhu. 
this is just the trailer, picture of a monkey. Hmm. He sent down oh, under shadows. Oh, it already wet. Some of them were completely covered with wet trash. People have been punctured there. Have all their body fluids oozing out, and then they have this cold, cold rain falling on them. They were soaked to the skin. The bush in which they were lying, the bushes were totally, they had gone cold, the canal water turned cold, the earth became cold. And then a strong gale started. So not only was cold raindrops soaking them, a very cold wind, a gale, it was like a storm hit them. They were, they were wondering what is happening. And then ominous lightning and thunderclaps were heard. And lightning struck. The dacoits were really in a very bad shape. And suddenly the rain changed to hail. Ice balls falling from the sky, right on their head, on their bodies. Those were fractured limbs. This was not the kind of acupuncture that they wanted or precaution. Blinded and drenched, they began to shiver, feeling completely helpless against the fury of nature. A quick uh, reaction from all of you. What do you think about Lord Indra in this case? He's punishing with thieves. He was punishing with thieves? Are you with him? Why are you with him? He's trying to serve Lord Nathaniel Prabhu. Do you like people who serve the Lord? Yes. Do you like to associate with them? At the temple, do you have people who serve the Lord? Yeah. Do you glorify them? Do you celebrate their birthdays? Do you give them gifts? Do you think it is all right if we do the same thing with Lord Indra or some of us does that in this situation? Now, some of us are having concerns. Some said yes. Maybe some of us are wondering whether we should or we should not, because does it fall under the category of? Does it fall under the category of worshipping another controller, another devata? Is it, is it all right to worship devatas? Yes or no? Or depends on the circumstances? Depends on the circumstances? Devatas, their spiritual maturity. That is interesting. Say yes. You say yes? Okay. <laughs> all right. Is it all right to worship and glorify devotees at the temple? Yes. Why is it uh, all right to worship devotees? Serve the Lord. Who do you think the devtas serve? Do you think they have sufficient maturity because they serve the Lord? Do you think they ever serve anyone else? 
Do you think the devotees ever serve anyone else? Can devotees be put into illusion? So still we worship them or we kind of take a break till they come out of illusion? <laughs> so do you think the devtas also get correctional measures? So is it all right to worship devtas if we look at them as servants of the Lord? If that is the way we interact with them. Is it all right? So Lord Indra did not like the idea that they had come to harm Lord Nityananda. So he did his part. He found an opportunity, did his part. He, did, he wasn't just wanting to punish them. He wanted them to understand. That it is wrong, that it is incorrect on their part to not have spent time to realize the glories of our mission. He wanted them to realize that this punishment is so that they can improve. It wasn't that Lord Indra was malicious. There's no malice on his part. Yeah. There's another incident in the 10th canto where we can think that for a certain moment he was really <coughs> very much agitated. Yes. In a sense, the Sambartaka clouds to him down. That is another episode. But here, he is worshipable. Here, we glorified Lord Indra. After a few hours, which seemed like yugas for the decoits, their leader was a young, intelligent gentleman and misused all of his abilities to become a decoit, became very thoughtful. became philosophical because he was learned. He became philosophical. Tried to understand what is happening. Because he was the one who previously had indicated that this Abhuduk is well known and great personalities come to meet him. So he tried to connect the dots. Why would great personalities like kings and really well to do people come to see an Abhudut? Because he must have some potential. So now when he was in a situation where he felt very helpless, all of his uh, abilities as a leader, his abilities as a Dakoid king, all of them had deserted him. Then he had to seek refuge somewhere. And fortunately for him, his refuge was his intellect, which had been groomed some time before, maybe during his upbringing, through knowledge or with knowledge. And hence he becomes philosophical. This is very important. If we have been groomed uh, with good knowledge, if we have been trained with good knowledge, and we have had uh, good realizations about how that knowledge works. And many a times in life, things happen. In life, you know, you have occasions where you may be at the receiving end of what life gives you. And you feel helpless. You feel demotivated. And you want to seek refuge. For people who have been trained in the understanding of philosophy properly, even when they're demotivated, dejected, and they feel helpless, and they want to seek shelter somewhere, they find shelter in all of that knowledge and realization they have. 
Hence, in the Vedic society, he began this training very young. He trained them to inculcate habits that will help them inquire, understand, relate to, and apply. If the training simply <coughs> makes them become a well-trained robot, where they do not understand how to inquire, how to understand, and how to apply, then we'll simply have a society of ritualists. However, if the training is otherwise, where they know how to inquire, understand, relate to, and apply, then we have a society, the rituals are performed with proper understanding. Many a times, we think that if black is not desired, then the only desirable thing is white. However, we never care to define what is white. Our understanding of white is that which is not black. Similarly, whenever we understand that hollow rituals are not helpful, we may think, then what should we do? We should not have rituals. Rather than think, that rituals with understanding is helpful, isn't it? Hence, good training in knowledge is necessary. And how do we know that this training is, you know, we are receiving proper training or we are giving the right training in knowledge? Inquiry should never, ever, ever be Stopped. People who make inquiries should never be persecuted unless and until their inquiries are hurting the common society. Inquiries should always be encouraged. And in response, they should be given an understanding which they can relate to. And they should be able to apply it in their day-to-day -day lives. So what happens to the young Brahmana who has now become philosophical? For that, you may have to come tomorrow.